Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, after that uh, extremely interesting uh, speech by the Admiral, um, we're now moving on to uh, a substantive part of our uh, program today, uh, session two, the evolution of the Australia-Japan Strategic and Defence Partnership. I hope in my opening remarks earlier I didn't steal too much of the thunder of the four um, speakers we have uh, before us. Uh, they are respectively Rear Admiral uh, Akimoto, uh, uh, retired uh, uh, from the Japan Maritime Self-Defence Force. He's now the Senior Research Fellow of the Ocean Policy Research Institute at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Professor Alan uh, Dupont, uh, who is uh, uh, from um, the Lowy Institute uh, and uh, uh, has uh, published extensively on these sorts of issues. Dr Shiro Armstrong, co-director of the Australia-Japan Research Centre at the ANU, and Mr Gordon Flake, CEO of the Perth US Asia Centre. Uh, that's a very uh, diverse group of people and I look forward very much to hearing their views on the subjects or the issues that are uh, the scope of this particular session, namely, what are Australia and Japan's interests in Indo-Pacific security and what factors are involved in the convergence of those interests. Secondly, what are the opportunities for defence and security cooperation, including in promoting a rules-based regional order? And thirdly, what is the interaction of economics and security in the Australia-Japan relationship? First of all, I'll uh, just uh, alert the four speakers, please, to the time limit of 10, preferably no more than 12 minutes each, um, and that will allow a certain amount of time for discussion following the presentations. First of all, then, Rear Admiral Akimoto, would you like to take the floor, please? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, mention uh, the presentation today is a little bit uh, provocative, especially for the uh, participants from China. Uh, first of all, <laughs> let me say that they are very sorry. <laughs> the structure of uh, the uh, international society uh, since the end of the Cold War has uh, progressed along the globalization. Uh, within that structure, global economy can be guaranteed by the stability of sea lands, uh, which support borderless economic activities. Today, uh, the major arteries sustaining the global economy are sea lands passing through the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific, uh, which are world public goods serving vital, uh, uh, serving vital, uh, vital common interest. This uh, presentation aims to suggest a new dimension to the maritime security cooperation between Australia and Japan in the seas straddling over the Bay of Bengal and the sea in the Oceania as the outer rim of the mainstream, main shipping stream. Of course, the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal are in separate, inseparable portions constituting the Indian Oceans, but the security environment of the Arabian Sea is quite different uh, from that of Bay of Bengal, and the actors concerned are different as well. It, may, it might be better to focus on the Bay of Bengal when we see, uh, when we discuss the security operation, uh, cooperation between Australia and Japan in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Indian, Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific Ocean, there are several uh, overcrowded sea areas and choke points. They are the uh, Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, the South China Sea, East China Sea. Uh, Syrian passing through such highly accessed sea areas uh, uh, led to some convergence point, uh, which are Strait of Babylon Mandeb, Strait of Holmes, and Strait of Malacca, Singapore. How would the global economy be impacted if the main shipping stream were stopped to navigation? Not stopped to navigate. Uh, as far as energy flow is concerned, about 40% of the world's seaborne oil uh, trade passes through the Strait of Hormuz, which almost all of the uh, oil tanker traveling across the Indian Ocean then pass through the Strait of Malacca, Singapore for entering the South China Sea. Uh, in the year of 2013, uh, 2013 Ocean Policy Research Institute 
uh, conducted a research study to examine the economic losses in the case of oil tankers transport from Middle East to Japan could not transit into the South China Sea on account of severe international dispute. A scenario uh, of unable transit of oil tanker in South China Sea uh, was uh, illustrated as, uh, as shown. Uh, please uh, con don't think it over. <laughs> this is only the assumption. Uh, we, we needed some uh, scenario to uh, study how, how the uh, Japanese economy be impacted. Uh, the first uh, confrontation between China and the other littoral nations in South China Sea intensifies, breaking out weapon exchanges apprehended. Uh, Armed uh, with the situation, U.S. deploys naval forces in the Western Pacific. Uh, China declares the waters inside the uh, Nine Dash Line as denial zone, denial area, and also claims that all foreign vessels should apply the China's uh, permission for innocent passage right. In the waters inside uh, the uh, Nine Dash Line, because uh, uh, there is under uh, China's uh, sovereignty. In addition, China warns foreign uh, large tanker not to enter uh, the uh, not enter the said area under the uh, pretext of preventing, preventing environmental contamination, arguing that if large oil tanker is accidentally attacked and uh, oil spill uh, oil spill take place, the marine, uh, marine environment should uh, severely be damaged. Further, China uh, reveals that uh, if U.S. deployment forces strong some assertive action, China will take anti-access operation in the area, uh, sea area between the first and the second island <coughs> chains. Uh, how would the uh, VLCC large tanker would uh, bound for Japan be operated under the uh, assumption? Avoiding such a dangerous situation, all uh, large tanker from Middle East to Japan cannot but make detour from the Malacca Singapore Street to the Malombok and the Makassar Street to navigate along the eastern coast of the Philippines, northward to Japan. Further, if area inside the second island chain beca become anti-access area of China, all BLC uh, uh, bound for Japan will uh, detour around the south coast of Australia and proceed northward to Japan to avoid navigation within the second island chain. How do the Japanese economy be impacted? Uh, roughly speaking, Japan needs to supplement 10 more VLC if all of the VLCs to Japan are obliged to, needed to uh, detour from the Malacca Singapore Street to the Lombok Street. It is not so difficult for Japan to supplement an additional 10 VLC seats. But uh, their uh, charter will incur another some 300 million US dollars per year. If all of the VLCs detour to the south coast of Australia, Japan needs to supplement an additional 50 uh, VLCs more. It is too difficult to get such number of VLCs uh, for Japan. Uh, even if Japan can hire another 50 VLCs, it will, it will incur 1.2 billion US dollar per year. Uh, moreover, in such a situation, it is estimated that the world oil price will rise around the world. If the oil price rises uh, 50 US dollar per barrel, uh, Japan will have to pay another 66 billion US dollar a year. Further, the study estimated the world stock price will remain 10% down, 10% lower for more than two years. Uh, this decline will cause an adverse impact on the global economy. When it comes to container shipping, we, uh, we can easily estimate rerouting will bring about a chaos situation on the market because the container shipping is requested absolutely just in time. Uh, thus far, now possible influence uh, for, uh, upon Japan's economy have been revealed as it may be easily recognized. Japan can reroute uh, her fleet to the Western Pacific, but China and several ASEAN nations facing the South China Sea have no alternative but to pass through the South China Sea. For China, reportedly import 5 million barrels of oil a day, most of which are carried by sea. Besides mega container hub ports, uh, sustaining ASEAN's uh, economic prosperity face the South China Sea. So in such a situation, not only the regional but the global economy should suffer uh, cas catastrophic damage. 
In such an emergency situation, taking precautions against some uh, containment strategy like the uh, proposed US offshore control, uh, China is expected to strengthen area denial and uh, anti-access capabilities inside and outside of the first island chain. At the same time, China may attempt to obtain sea control capability in the Bay of Bengal, uh, where exist important shipping ports and pipelines for mainland China in order to overcome the uh, so-called uh, Manapa dilemma. In such a situation uh, mentioned, uh, securing the sea lines of communication along the route from vicinity of Sri Lanka in the Bay of Bengal to the sea area between the first and the second island chain in Western Pacific via the Lombok and Makassar Strait will become an indispensable uh, strategy for Japan, Australia, the United States, and other uh, nations. Uh, maybe uh, China as well. It may be uh, referred to as the stroke security over the outer rim of the main shipping stream by passing the Malacca Singapore Strait and the South China Sea. Uh, for Japan and Australia, opening the uh, stroke in the outer rim will be an indispensable uh, condition to supply the national demand in contingency or emergency situations, uh, China as well. Uh, likewise, for US, controlling the outer rim will be a vital interest for its military strategy. Observing the security environment of the uh, outer rim, except for the north side of the sea between the first and the second island chain, uh, there are a lack of well-functioning international arrangement or framework to maintain maritime order. Therefore, safety and freedom of navigation cannot be guaranteed in case of contingency or emergency situations. Security of the seas in the north area of the second and the first, uh, first and the second island chain seems to be secured under the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. Uh, concerning the Bay of Bengal, India had been an only state responsible for ensuring security there, but the current strategic structure of the Bay of Bengal has obviously turned more complex. The economic growth of India and China, as well as their increasing maritime activities, are promoting the confluence of seas in East Asia and South Asia. When the two seas merge, uh, culture and strategies of different natures meet, uh, meet. The city in the Bay of Bengal is a common property of the world, and there is no doubt that stabilization, stabilization of the security environment there serves the common interests of all nations. On the other hand, the reality is uh, uh, each of state making its way into the Bay of Bengal has its own strategy for global competition, a situation likely to provoke uh, confrontation between or among different states. Uh, China is uh, at present taking a variety of approach to the littoral of the Bay of Bengal, seeking to have greater influence in the sea lanes or to gain economic benefit. China's approach, whether they are competitive or cooperative, are grateful, uh, greatly affecting the security environment of the main shipping artery in the Bay of Bengal, heading to the Malacca Singapore Strait. Thus, maintaining safety of navigation in the outer rim, which provides an alternative sea route in the Bay of Bengal, heading to Lombok Strait instead of Malacca Singapore Strait, will be an important strategic imperative for Japan and Australia, as well as the US. In the view, Sri Lanka is a very uh, key state, key strategic state. Uh, on the uh, Western Pacific side of the outer rim, the great uh, gateway of uh, Makassar Strait faces the west edge of Micronesia that constitutes the uh, southern part of the sea between the first and second island chain, where there is a vital sea area which provides uh, a detouring route from the South China Sea and strategic stroke among Australia, Japan, and the US. But na navigation safety is not necessarily be secured there. Republic of Palau. Palau is located at the center position in the southern part of the sea area between the first and the second island chain. Thus, uh, the United States concluded the com compact of free association with Palau, as well as with the uh, uh, 
Federation Micronesia, Micronesia Federation and the Marshall Island, uh, in which the US have a right to military affairs in, in uh, compact areas. The, but the, this uh, COFA with the uh, Micronesia Federation and Marshall Island will uh, terminate in 2000, uh, 2023, 2023. Power vacuum phenomena may be brought to Micronesia after the end of COFA. So let me conclude. The, uh, then what and how should Australia and Japan do? Firstly, uh, we should try to obtain sea control capability over the outer rim so that we could keep shipping route and uh, strategic advantage in wartime. To be more concrete, the following is proposed. Uh, Australia and Japan should make a good relationship with the coastal states of Bay of Bengal and the island nations of Micronesia so that the two states could obtain geopolitical power balance, power, power bases uh, for uh, activities both in commercial and uh, defense field. Uh, one key state is Sri Lanka, located in the western part of the outer rim. Australia and Japan can plan the multilateral naval exercise in association, association with India. Sri Lanka and the United States using Port of Sri Lanka, the exercise may be planned as the framework of exercise Malabar or cooperation afloat readiness and training, Karat. Another key state is Palau occupying the center position in the sea between the uh, south portion of the first and second island chain. Australia and Japan should assist Palau for uh, capacity building. Uh, that is my conclusion, but uh, 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 this, this my uh, conclusion is based on my uh, very uh, <coughs> pessimistic uh, perspective. So, needless to say, needless to say, we must uh, do first is the uh, make effort to uh, set up some uh, cooperative uh, security architecture uh, with China. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, uh, Rear Admiral um, Akamoto, uh, Professor Dupont, and before I didn't mention that he's actually currently the Professor of International Security at the University of New South Wales. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Murray. Good morning, everybody. Actually, it's good afternoon. I've been encouraged to uh, keep my presentation brief and to the point, so I'm going to do that. Um, the f I want to start off by just reflecting a bit on at the broadest level, what are Australia and, and uh, Japan's shared interests in the Asia-Pacific? Um, we've heard the phrase rules-based order used about 25 times already, I think, this morning. So I just want to unpack that a little bit because I think we need to have a discussion around what that means and why Japan and Australia committed to its preservation. So the, the key point is this, that if you reflect back to 1945, the rules-based system was a system of shared interests and shared values around the victors in the Second World War, essentially the European uh, democracies, the United States, and Australia was a fully paid-up partner there. And Japan, of course, came on board and democratized, democratized rapidly. So Japan and Australia have benefited from a system that privileges liberal, democ liberal democratic values, the free market, the institutions that continue to be dominant in the world today, and all that was underpinned by US military power. That is the system that both Japan and Australia seek to preserve. Now, all the more so when for the first time in 70 odd years, that system is under serious challenge globally, but particularly in this part of the world, primarily because of China's rise. And the question mark over China that really that I guess we have to address today is not only what kind of China will it be, but what does it mean for the rest of us? And it's increasingly clear to me over the last four years that China's challenge uh, to the regional order is detrimental to those values and interests that I've just outlined. Because the alternative view or the alternative order that we confront is a region dominated by the largest, most powerful Asian country that neither shares our values and not too many of our interests. Now, one would hope, as a good diplomat, we can reconcile those conflicting interests and values, but I don't see that happening in the short term. In fact, I see a widening gap between Australia 
and Japan and the things that we believe in and what China is seeking to do. Okay, now, why is it that Japan and Australia are now coming together more closely than ever before in our modern history? There are a lot of reasons for that. I'm just gonna focus on a couple. Um, let me just continue with the China narrative because it's central. Japan is becoming increasingly anxious about its position in the Asian regional order and about its own security. And that's pretty clear. And a lot of that's we've seen generated by some of the tensions of the East China Sea directly involving uh, Japan and China, not involving the United States, I might add, at this stage. So this has nothing to do with the United States at one level. Um, so Japan, is, as it's become more anxious about its future, it's looked for more friends because the key conclusion Japanese policymakers have made, I'd say over the last five to 10 years, uh, is that in the face of a challenge from China to its core security interests, uh, maybe Japan cannot rely upon the United States to come to the rescue like the 7th Cavalry that it needs to diversify what we call its political and strategic risk. It needs more friends. And so it has begun to actively seek more friends in the region. And when it looks to the region, the one country that stands out as a person who could become a closer friend is Australia. And why is that? Because not only do we share this commitment to the international order, or the old order, if you like, that we've, we've had here for 70 years, but of course, Australia and Japan have been fully paid up members of the US alliance. That's a, an, that's a significant factor in Japan's thinking. Um, we have often been called the northern and southern anchors of the US alliance. So it is quite natural that Japan will look at Australia as one of the first countries it would seek to deepen its relationship with in the future. Um, okay, now, so you can see that China's rise is pushing Japan and Australia together more closely. Not only about uh, China, it is also concerns in Japan about the durability and commitment of the United States to this region, notwithstanding the US rebalance. Now, I think that's exaggerated personally, but I can understand Japanese concerns there. So this also goes to the heart of the US alliance. And uh, I know James Brown is here and his center put out a, a very good paper on this just yesterday. But my big takeaway from that is that the alliance itself is changing. It's no longer the old hub and spokes model where the US is at the centre and all the interaction is between the US and the spokes, including Australia and Japan. Increasingly, it's around the hub of the wheel. So Japan and Australia are talking more and more together. Uh, and, and, you know, Australia and Korea will be talking more together. And there are other players on that, on that sort of hub, if you like, to stay with that that metaphor. So a more fluid uh, partnership of equals within the US alliance is also the context for Japan and Australia working more closely together. Two other points I think are relevant here. If you look back historically, there have been two constraints on the development of Australia defence and security relations with Japan. Um, one, obviously, after the Second World War, there are a whole generation of Australians who would not countenance having a defence relationship with a former adversary. Now, by the late 1980s, that generation's influence was fading and Australia was looking at Japan as a model democracy and a potential defence partner. And in 1989, those who remember General Gratian went to Japan and began the process of the new defence relationship. And over the next 20 or so years, it's developed uh, along the path of pretty conventional uh, bilateral defence relationships. But we're now at a tipping point, okay? We've, we've gone from being reasonable partners and some defence and security cooperation, improving all the time, to a point where we now may become more than just, if I can say, normal defence partners. We may actually be moving to another level. Some people have described it as a quasi-defence alliance. I think that's probably going a bit too far, but we are on the verge of something qualitatively different with Japan. So why is it that we've got to this point? Uh, it's not only about these external factors I've mentioned, but the Australian perception is Japan is now open for business in defence and security in the way it was not pre-Shinzo Abe. So 
Prime Minister Abe has changed the, the environment for Australia as well as for Japan. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of the uh, focus has been on the relaxation of the constitutional restraints on Japanese defence policy, and that's been important. That has allowed Australia to become more of a full partner with Japan because Japan can now reciprocate. But I think equally important has been the liberalising, if you like, of the long-standing um, constraints on the export of Japanese defence technology. That is why Japan is now able to bid for the Australian submarine. Okay? So that's been very important too because that's been a real constraint about what we could do with Japan. <coughs> so both those things have changed and they're underlying factors in actually allowing Australia and Japan to fulfil the potential of their defence and security relationship. Okay, a final point I want to make here is that uh, where do we go from here? Um, I have argued that the, if Japan is successful in winning the submarine tender, it could be a transformational decision in terms of the overall relationship, not just the defence relationship. Why do I argue that? Because Japan is increasingly seeing the submarine project uh, as a watershed moment in the, in the overall bilateral relationship with Australia, opening up all sorts of possibilities for cooperation in science and technology, in uh, manufacturing, industry, telecommunications, and a whole range of associated industries uh, and sectors that Australia has been trying to gain access to over the last 20 to 30 years largely unsuccessfully because Japan hadn't really seen Australia as a full partner in that sense. I think that's changing. The submarine project's quite critical. But even if Japan doesn't win the submarine tender, I think the qualitative nature of the defence and security relationship is going to change uh, dramatically, and it is going to go to a new level, and there will be consequences. There's an upside and downside to all these things, right? So the upside is a more productive relationship between the two countries. The downside is um, we may have increased our political and strategic risk because of China's rise and because China's view uh, that this is not a partnership that they want to see continue and develop. Uh, I think that's a fair summation of the Chinese view. They have been publicly critical of, um, shall I say, the, 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 the Julie Bishop initiative to, to launch a new strategic partnership with Japan. So it's pretty clear the, that China does not want this to go ahead. So that's the downside risk for us, and we have to make judgments about where we come out in a, in a net sense and all that. So I, I guess my, my final point is this, that um, in this, it's very hard to predict how all this is going to play out because there are so many moving parts. But to me, the key driver of where our relationship with Japan goes in the future and what sort of security environment we're going to see in this region is whether China is going to rethink what it's doing in the South China Sea. It is a fait accompli in the sense that they've already done what they've done, but the question is how much more will China do and how it will operationalise its, its military garrisons and capabilities in the South China Sea and potentially right through into the Indian Ocean. How is China going to operationalise that? That's the key question for me. And that's going to really determine a lot of our responses in terms of our security relationship and partnerships with other countries, whether it's Australia, Japan, Australia, United States, Australia, India, and all the other uh, relationships that we've, we'll probably be talking about today. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan. And uh, I'd like to call now on uh, uh, Shiro Armstrong. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Murray. And let me take this opportunity to thank Rory and the National Security College for inviting me to, to talk today. Um, it's a real privilege to talk on a distinguished panel. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the economic relationship, so a bit of a different take, um, the, the Australia-Japan economic relationship. Um, I think that's important to understand for seeing why, seeing what underpins the deep and broad um, relationship between our two countries. Um, and there'll be some security implications. Um, most of these will be implicit, um, some explicit. I'll rely on Gordon after me to draw those out explicitly. 
Um, so I thought I'd start just quickly um, by looking back at what's led us to this point. Um, some really important agreements that we signed very early on. Uh, the 1957 Agreement on Commerce, still in a climate not too removed from the end of the war. Um, a very important agreement um, that was difficult to do politically, but we were the first, Australia was the first country to afford and grant Japan most favoured nation access um, under the WTO, so oh, back then the GATT, sorry. So we gave Japan equal best treatment of our trading partners. That was a very strong, um, significant, not only symbol, but um, reassurance to Japan to open up and um, rely on us as a, a trading partner. Um, followed by the 1976 Basic Treaty on Friendship and Cooperation, which we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of this year. Um, and that extended and, and further broadened the earlier Most Favoured Nation treatment that was for goods trade um, to really treating Japanese investment and migration um, on equal best terms of our, as our other um, partners. Um, so very two big watershed agreements um, early on that helped lay the foundation for our current economic relationship. Um, Australia and Japan were instrumental in the creation of APEC um, and leadership there in Australia and Japan. Um, throughout the 70s um, and 80s, I think, um, talking those things through and showing, showing leadership with other countries in the region. Um, and I'll come back to the role of Australia and Japan in, in regional um, forums later. And then more recently signed in 2014 and in force about a year ago, the Japan-Australia EPA, which many of you would be aware of, which takes the relationship to the next, next level, economic relationship, as well as um, broader political relationship, I'd argue. Um, so I'll come back to that as well. Um, and I want to talk about four things, basically. So the first is to talk about how important Australia is as a, a raw materials supplier to Japan and Northeast Asia, something I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but I thought it's worth just um, repeating and, and reinforcing. Um, second of all, to talk about the breadth and depth of the economic relationship, um, talk about um, some of the, the, the scale of that and, and what the new areas are. Um, I want to talk about how the bilateral economic relationship is actually beyond bilateral and how we nested in a, a deeply interdependent region in East Asia and across the Asia Pacific and increasingly towards South Asia as India looks and acts east. Um, and finally I'll finish with um, a bit of discussion on leadership regionally and I'm talking here mostly in um, economic agreements and in economics, economic architecture. Um, but I think there are important implications beyond the economics. Um, so just remind us how important Australia is as a, a, a supplier of energy to Japan. We supply 21%. Um, this is gas and coal mostly. Um, used to be a bit more uranium. Um, larger supplier than, than Saudi Arabia, Middle East countries. I think this, this says a lot. And we are a secure and stable supplier um, that Japan South Korea and even China depend on. Um, so we, outside of oil, I think we are the most important um, across a, most of the strategic raw materials, the most important supplier, and us being a stable, secure uh, supplier is very important. So we supply over 61 or 60 percent of Japan's iron ore, <coughs> bauxite, aluminium, um, nickel, so forth. Um, and Really, this is, is a key part of, of why Australia is sort of important um, in Northeast Asia and, and Asia more, more broadly. So I said, it's, it's almost everything except oil. So that's, that's the basis on which our economic relationship um, is built. Uh, bilateral trade is, is around $66 billion a year, both ways. Um, Australia is the second largest trading partner of Japan. Um, sorry. Japan is the second largest trading partner of Australia, behind China. Third is the United States, fourth is South Korea. And we are Japan's fifth largest trading partner. Um, Japan holds the fourth largest stock of foreign investment in Australia. Um, investment the other way from Australia to Japan is, is relatively low. In fact, um, foreign direct investment stock in Japan is extremely low. I think that's a new area of, of opportunity as Japan opens up further to foreign investment to, to modernise uh, or to, to reboot its economic recovery. Um, Japan played a, a crucial role in developing our natural resources sector and making it the most efficient um, 
resource sector in the world and at the technological frontier um, with investment, but more importantly, earlier on um, with long-term contracts um, developed between Australia and Japan that, that really gave um, stability and, and, and security in, in those business deals. Um, the economic relationship, the foreign investment from Japan to Australia is diversifying rapidly beyond the natural resources, um, food and beverage, retail, and you would have heard of the um, takeover of uh, toll last year by Japan Post um, at $6.5 billion. And I think that shows how important Australia is as a stable, open um, market, a mature market, um, and Japan's acquisition, Japan Post's acquisition of, of toll, for example, shows that, you know, the management, the expertise we have in logistics um, uh, internationally, I think, is, is an area Japan is ex uh, expanding into. Um, our bilateral EPA in force last year is very important. It's the first agreement Japan signed that significantly liberalized agriculture. Japan has signed many agreements that really didn't touch the Japanese agricultural sector or services sector. We've made some significant inroads into Japanese services and agriculture. The TPP makes some further inroads and helps Japan's third arrow um, reforms along to, to an extent. Um, so I think those are really important points to understand and where the economic relationship currently is. But it is a beyond bilateral um, economic relationship. As I mentioned, it's nested in a, a really highly integrated region. Um, East Asian intra-regional trade shares are equivalent to that of Europe, um, despite not having a strong institutional foundation for those economic linkages. Um, Japanese goods are exported to Australia directly, but also through China and Southeast Asia. So a lot of Japanese branded products don't come directly from China, but importantly, through the production networks and supply chains um, throughout the region to Australia. I think that's quite important to understand the beyond bilateral element. Um, many Japanese companies in Australia um, that invest here sell not just back to Japan, but to the rest of the world, and importantly into Southeast Asia and China. And in fact, uh, Mitsui sells more, Mitsui is a large trading company, um, is one example, sells more to China um, than it does to Japan. Um, and many were surprised, and really think about this, shouldn't be a surprise, but the CEO, Australian CEO of Mitsui coming out last year in support of the China-Australia free trade agreement. I think it was a bit surprising to some people, but from year to year, the big trading companies sell to whoever buys at the highest price. And if that's China, Southeast Asia, United States, it's not surprising. Um, and both Australia and Japan have China as their largest trading partner, and we're locked into China economically. Um, Japan's really important to China. You might think it's a lopsided, some people think it's a lopsided relationship. I, I think it's mutually um, extremely interdependent. Japan's extremely important to China um, for its investment, its trade into China, as well as the technology that China relies on. Um, and also Australia, as I mentioned before, um, not just to Japan, but to, to China as well, a, strategic, a supplier of strategic raw materials. And increasingly, as the commodity boom is now over, um, there's going to be the growth market for our services. Importantly, sitting where we're sitting, hopefully education. Okay, so I'll just finish up on, on what's next before I run out of time. I think, um, like with the formation of APEC, where Australia and Japan work together, really is important for Australia, Japan, and other partners in the region uh, to work together in shaping um, the shape of the region, sh shaping the region and regional architecture. Um, and I think this is in need of a reboot, uh, and I'll explain that briefly. Um, we're both members of the G20, we're both members of the TPP, we're both um, negotiating the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, there's a real significant role that we're able to play if we can step up and work together to play this role of leadership. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was signed. Um, the challenge now is going to be to ratify the agreement, um, and that's not going to happen all that quickly in the current climate in the United States, um, and that's a, a big challenge. Another challenge is going to be um, accession to the TPP for non-member countries and how, how we facilitate that and how we facilitate that at a, a high level of commitment uh, will be very important. Um, 
Um, importantly, we've got a free trade agreement with the United States. Japan um, has a, an EPA with us, but the TPP I see largely is a big bilateral, where all the action is, is between the United States and Japan. Um, now, importantly, China, India, Indonesia are not part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They are important economic partners of Australia. And Japan, India, Indonesia will continue to grow, become much more important economic partners. There's a recognition, I think, by those three countries and, and, and many others that they're not going to be able to join the TPP anytime soon. The TPP comes into force perhaps early to mid-2018. There's still a long accession road has to go through US Congress after that. So I think being realistic about that, um, where the action is on the China, India, Indonesia front will be in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, and I think, um, I think there is recognition in China and India of the importance of RCEP, as RCEP agreement. Without a strong RCEP um, agreement that is implemented and without China and India bringing especially China and India, and hopefully Indonesia, bringing strong commitments and liberalisation to open their markets, open their economies. Um, there will be no RCEP. And without an RCEP agreement, it's really left to the TPP. And given the recognition that India and, and China will not be able to be party to the TPP anytime soon, um, I think the calculation is not all that complicated. And hopefully we see um, these countries stepping up to the plate. Um, so I think. These are all important agreements moving towards um, a broader free trade area of the Asia Pacific, um, including India and other non-APEC members, um, but also towards a broader global regime change. Uh, the WTO is extremely um, valuable and useful for underpinning um, open markets globally still, um, and I think that needs um, a bit of a, a refresh and reboot boot given the Doha round is stalled. Now, I'll just finish with, we've been talking about the rules-based order and the open rules-based order. I think it's important to recognise how the WTO, at least on the trade front, underpins that and how um, that's been such a useful um, forum for resolving disputes, um, including with, especially with, with China. Uh, the rare earth metal case, the embargo of, of blocking exports, supposedly blocking exports to Japan and elsewhere, um, was settled peacefully in the WTO with China accepting all the, the rulings. Um, the only parts that they're appealing to is to understand more where their accession rules differ from the general WTO rules. So I think that's a good news story and the importance of the WTO. And hopefully I've helped out on the economic front. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Shiro. Uh, could I call on you, Gordon, to um, give us the US perspective? Well, as you'll quickly ascertain, there's a little bit more Arizona than Australia in my accent. Uh, but with the shared love of sand and red rock and better beaches, I'm happy today not to give the US perspective, but a Western Australian perspective. I've spent the last two years as CEO of, uh, of the Perth US Asia Center at the University of Western Australia. Uh, and while Professor Rory Metcalf in the earlier introduction kind of hedged a little bit on the notion of the Indo-Pacific, saying it's a contested concept. <laughs> In Western Australia, it is not a contested concept. Uh, it was advanced strongly by Stephen Smith, you know, a Western Australian foreign minister, defense minister. It continues to be advanced strongly by Julie Bishop, a foreign minister from Western Australia. But more importantly, perched in Perth as we are, uh, we call ourselves Australia's Indian Ocean capital. And as such, the constructs make a lot more sense uh, from Western Australia. Uh, the Japanese ambassador referred to Australia and Japan as bookends in the region. Uh, we prefer the notion of, a, of Australia being the fulcrum point between India uh, and between Japan in the Indo-Pacific. So rather than being at the bottom of the Asia-Pacific, out of sight, out of mind, at the middle. Uh, and obviously that gives certain advantages to, to Perth's particular position in that regard. Um, I will make a couple of broader observations on, on the topic uh, and then focus more specifically uh, on this panel's you know, issue in terms of the Japan-US relationship. Um, first, I thought it's important to clarify uh, when we're talking about you know Japan Australia relationship in the last ten years, the last five years in particular, the biggest change has taken place in Japan, not in Australia. Australia has long had kind of a, a broader kind of strategic view of the relationship, uh, and intricately intertwined between the, it and its alliance relationship with the United States. But Japan is, has been a, a nation that's had a lot of constrictions. 
on its ability to participate. And so as previous speakers have mentioned, really has been the shift politically within Japan, moves by Prime Minister Abe that have shifted it. And, and one of the most high profile ones, of course, Alan has already addressed in great detail, and that is Japan's ability to participate in you know, defense contracting, if you will, uh, where there were legal and cultural and regulatory restrictions within Japan uh, in, in that process. But, but as such, it means that there's an awful lot more on the plate uh, than there was before, even just five years ago. And, and so this discussion becomes a lot less symbolic and a lot more concrete than it would have been just five years ago. Um, the other clarifying comment I'll make is that, um, you know, in some respects, if you look at Japan-Australia cooperation, it is still to date very much an Asia-Pacific relationship. Um, it is not yet fully an Indo-Pacific relationship. And I'll come back to this in a minute, because that may be the area where there's the greatest area for potential for expansion. Because thus far, and again, we heard it from the ambassador, Japan perceives the Australia-Japan relationship in the Asia-Pacific. They don't yet perceive the broader potential of it in the Indo-Pacific. And I appreciate the Admiral's you know, quiet, client inclusion of, of the, the Bay of Bengal, but the interesting thing is interesting. There, there wasn't much focus yet on the Australia piece of that in terms of the Bay of Bengal. Um, let me turn to the topic of hand, you know, the evolution of Australia-Japan strategic and defense partnership. And what I'll do is just hit three main points. First, looking at what I would describe as the push, you know, those external factors which have, you know, driven Japan and Australia closer together. And my remarks will closely track some of those that Alan has already given. Secondly, I'll focus on the pull, you know, those things internal that are actually driving a closer relationship. And then finally, I'll look at some of the opportunities that I think we haven't yet put on the table uh, for the relationship going forward, particularly as it deals with uh, the maritime issues going forward. Uh, the push issues are, are pretty obvious, but the important point I want to make here is that we cannot look at the Japan-Australia relationship in a vacuum. It is simply not a bilateral relationship. Every trend that I'm going to talk about and that we've talked about already mirror trends that have taken place in other relationships. So, so for example, if you looked at 2014, you know, there was a massive round of diplomacy taking place between Japan and Australia and then Japan and India, between Australia and, and India and Australia and Japan. And between, you know, if you look at the, the travel of the prime ministers, all three of them made those two visits their first and most important visits. You know, so uh, it, it's important to recognize that the same external push, the same external dynamics that is driving a closer relationship between Australia and Japan is also driving Korea to think about how its role in the region is, it's driving thinking in ASEAN, it's think, driving thinking about Japan's relationship with ASEAN, Japan's relationship with India, and it's useful to understand that it is not bilateral. It really is kind of a broader shift in, in, in the region at large. Uh, and obviously, the first and foremost factor in that is the rise of China. Uh, it's been addressed, I think, by every speaker thus far, so I won't go into too much detail. Uh, but I would note that it's useful to be um, um, kind of more direct in this. For political reasons, you know, one of the nice things about being in a university or a think tank is you can be a little bit more direct than the wonderful admiral who gave a very forward-leaking speech, but didn't, for the first 15 minutes, mention the word China, right? It's, it's kind of the Chinese version of certain countries right, that we kind of talk about. I attended about five years ago a conference in Europe that was very European in nature. They wanted to talk about creative destructionism in the global order. And, and of course, as you might imagine, everyone that was from Washington, D.C. said, so, so we're talking about China here, right? And the Europeans said, no, 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 we're not talking about China. We're talking about threats to the global order. You know, we've heard, you know, the liberal world system, you know, the, 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 the rules-based system. Uh, but really, the only country out now, there right now that is challenging in a significant way uh, that is crossing is China. And yet, there's a, a difficulty to kind of address that in a serious way. I would just make a couple of notes on that front. There has probably been no bigger beneficiary for the last 50 years of that system than China. And so I think it's very important to state out very clearly from whether it's an Australian perspective, an American perspective, a Japanese perspective, that we are all deeply vested in China's benefiting from that system. So to say this, to what I'm saying, is in no way or shape anti-China, right? Uh, it, because that system itself has served them extremely well. Other external factors that are, are worth mentioning just very briefly, and again, they've already been addressed, so I won't go into them in the great detail, are the U.S. rebalance, the pivot to Asia. And again, Alan described this very well as is the hub and spoke turning to the hub. 
there is a heavy priority on you know, like-minded countries working together. And the way that was reflected in the Admiral's speech today you know, was noting that you know, this is not a system that is made based on right, might versus makes right or a st strict hierarchy. You know, obviously, there is a hierarchy in terms of capabilities, but in terms of shared interest and cooperation and working together, you know, that has always, I think, probably always been the aspiration that countries that have a shared interest and shared values would work together. And if you look at you know, what the US has done for the last 50 years in Southeast Asia, what it can constantly tries to push South Korea and Japan to do together, or Australia together, that, that's not a new theme. You know, the pivot is not a, a new theme, it's just articulating it in a more clear way going forward. Um, I would note, again, from a Western Australian perspective in, in, in particular, uh, it was refreshing today to hear a Japanese ambassador make a pitch you know, for Mitsubishi heavy industry submarines. You know, that, that's actually quite a historic thing. I mean, I've been working in Japan for almost 30 years. It's very rare. I mean, it's common for Australian ambassadors or US ambassadors, or European ambassadors to come in and pitch everything from Airbus to Boeing to whatever, right? But to have a Japanese ambassador say, you know, ours is more reliable, it's on time, it, you know, it's under budget, it, you know, it, it has these capabilities. It's kind of, it, it tells you what a different world we're living in right now. I would add to that, uh, you know, again, from a Western Australian perspective where you have HMAS Sterling, the largest naval base in the Australian Navy, you have a growing capacity at the Henderson Marine Complex, you know, and obviously in a long coastline, which is the closest to Asia, there is a, a keen interest in these developments, and I think it'll be uh, something that will play out uh, in, in the future going forward. Let me move on quickly to talk about some of the issues that kind of pull Australia and, and, and Japan closer together in this strategic relationship we're discussing. But these are those areas that are really internal. Again, a lot of them have already been raised before. The shared interests and values, the liberal rules-based world order. Um, um, and here in the liberal world-based world order, I'd like to make a very important distinction. And again, the Admiral said it, but I'd like to make it even more explicit in that, is we often assume uh, that, that the existing system right now is one that's under U.S. hierarchy, you know, and what China is doing is changing that hierarchy. And in fact, we had a question from Dr. Tang specifically on that regard. Is, is a rising power chasing an old power? And often we hear, you know, this assertion that, you know, the U.S. had the Monroe Doctrine, uh, and so why can't China within the first island chain or the second island chain have the same Monroe Doctrine? But in, in, to be really explicit, you know, the current system, the liberal-based, rules-based orders, is a rejection, a repudiation of the Monroe Doctrine. Yeah? The Monroe Doctrine was a, a product of the previous century, that this system was designed to replace, you know, that wasn't based on might make, makes right, it wasn't based on hierarchy. And so it's important to kind of have that context as you're going forward, and particularly if you're looking at it from a close-based regional perspective. Um, but obviously, you know, those areas, again, the shared values, the shared interests, in the system, uh, the shared interest that Shira outlined extremely well in terms of trade, the free trade agreement, the TPP, uh, the ever-increasing you know, Australia-Japan economic interdependence between these two countries, cooperation on cyber, climate change, et cetera. Uh, but here's something else I thought I should emphasize, um, that it's important to recognize that Japan and Australia have a shared national interest in China's economic progress. And so often in the Australian media, this issue about Japan-Australia strategic cooperation is pitched as Japan is trying to pull Australia into its fight with China. That's the narrative, right? But if you think about it, you know, often when we talk about Australia-China relations versus Australia-US relationships, we make a very important distinction between investment and trade. You know, Australia spends, sends tons of stuff to China rocks and fuel, right? You know, but those are very transactionary at the border transactions that don't necessarily speak well in terms of the, the level of trust, the level of integration, the systems integration, the way investment does. And so obviously if you're Kim Beasley, who's now back from being ambassador, he wants to trumpet investment, investment, investment as a better measure of the importance of the economic relationship because you have invest. So look at the Japan-China relationship versus the Australia-China relationship. I would argue that China is far more important to Japan than it is to Australia, and far more deeply integrated. If you look at the level and numbers of Japanese investment in China, and the degree and the length to which China, Japan has been deeply intertwined and integrated into China, 
So the notion somehow that Japan is trying to pull Australia into a conflict on a security basis you know, you know, with China is a really shallow level analysis. Uh, the, the relationships are different. Uh, they're, they're, again, I think complementary and they have a shared interest. I, I've gone on too long, so let me just move very quickly on to opportunities. Uh, and here I would just go back to what I said at the outset. I think it's useful to think about one area of tremendous opportunity is the transition from the Japan-Australia relationship as an Asia-Pacific relationship into an Indo-Pacific relationship. So what is it that we could do to play on the things that the Admiral mentioned earlier on in terms of positive developments that are taking place in the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, Indian Ocean Rim Association, areas both where Japan is playing an observer role and is active but has tremendous capacity for training, for cooperation. You know, the more that they can do that together with Australia, the better going forward. More broadly then, you have even, without considering the Indian Ocean region, you know, tremendous areas for cooperation with ASEAN. You know, ASEAN has been a major priority for Australia. Uh, Australia has tremendous uh, capacity and strengths in they even relative to the United States. Uh, and this is an area where Japan has tremendous capacity. But there's not an awful lot of coordination, Japan, Australia, ASEAN. Uh, the Admiral earlier today was asked about the quadrilateral. That remains sensitive. It remains sensitive here in Australia. It's sensitive in, in India as well. You know, uh, but what is not sensitive is the growing number of trilaterals that are out there uh, and, and the potential for others, whether they be Japan, Australia, ASEAN, or Japan, Australia, China, even on energy security issues. If you look at the shared mutual dependence on energy issues, you all heard, uh, you may have seen this week, the first major shipment um, of, of LNG out of the Gorgon Wheatstone project in Western Australia. We probably got more media play in Western Australia than did here, but there's a $70 billion investment that's taken the last 10, 15 years to get up and running in Western Australia that began to pump LNG for the first time, and by all estimates, by the year 2020, Australia will be the world's largest LNG exporter, you know, surpassing Qatar. You know, that has real implications for the relationship with both Japan and China and the ability to cooperate on energy kind of security issues in the region in a very positive way going forward. Um, and then uh, finally, I think as I've gone on too, too long, I'll just wrap up by repeating um, what I said at the outset, that it's important to recognize that you know, Japan Australia relationships don't take place in a vacuum. They really take place in the broader context of developments in the region, both positive and negative. And I think there's a lot of potential as it moves from uh, an Asia-Pacific relationship to an Indo-Pacific relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon. That uh, also stimulates, I'm sure, uh, a lot of questions uh, from the audience. All four presentations, uh, I'm sure, will do that. Uh, could I uh, give it to questions first on the front here? Thank you. We've got 15 minutes for questions, so please make them brief and try to keep them to one each. Thank you please. very much. Uh, my name is Osamu Izawa. I'm coming from the Japanese Embassy. Uh, I'm head of the political section in the embassy. So uh, these days I have been working on the submarine cooperation. And I'd like to a uh, little bit uh, uh, talk about furthermore uh, the, the fact that Mr. Gordon described uh, in this presentation. Uh, sometimes I I found, uh, encountered a very interesting article in the Austrian newspaper that saying that if the Japan is uh, selected as a partner, uh, uh, this is a very uh, long-term contract. That means that uh, in the future, Australian, Australia would be a part of the Japan strategy. So and Jap uh, Australia would be invited to fight against China, that uh, what, uh, Gordon de described. So, but uh, I think that uh, a little bit uh, uh, from the Japanese diplomat, I uh, really is uh, I, I feel embarrassed uh, this argument because the, uh, we we are ready to transfer the uh, IP uh, so so that the Austria Austrian government can maintain the sovereign uh, sustainment in the future. So a strategy would be decided uh, the best interest judged by the Australian government, not Japanese government. So uh, even so. There's no any restriction on, on the submarine cooperation, and there's no constraint of the submarine cooperation put on the future strategic cooperation between Japan uh, between Japan and Australia. So, but I, I don't know how how can we 
interpret uh, this cautiousness uh, from uh, Australian public opinion leaders. Uh, some, there are some opinion leaders uh, develop this kind of argument. So we are very interested in the thinking of this argument. So uh, maybe uh, Dupont Sensei, please. I think that is that argument that you've just summarised is contrived and disingenuous because um, there is no sense in which whatever we do with Japan or any other country in terms of defence cooperation binds us naturally to their strategic objectives. You know, so I mean, if you want to apply that argument to every other country, you could apply it to when China buys, uh, you know, kilo submarines, kilo class submarines from the, from Russia. I mean, it, it's, it really is a bit of a silly argument, but you're absolutely right. It does exist. So let me try and explain why I think it is the case. I think there are two reasons, right? One is there is a lot of nervousness, uh, particularly in the Australian business community, about anything that might jeopardise our trade relationship with China. Okay, so the perception, there is a perception there, I think is uninformed, but nevertheless a perception that we can't rock the boat and anything we might do with Japan, not just submarines, by the way, would be seen by China as injurious to our relationship and incur their hostility, so we shouldn't do it, okay? Uh, and, and the submarines is just one part of that. So that's, so that's, that's a view in some parts of the Australian community, particularly in the business community, I find this quite a bit, okay? Um, there also is a kind of parallel set of arguments around uh, about Japanese, the Japanese militarising again. You know, this is the old Japan rising. Uh, Mr Abe is often described as a right-wing nationalist, etc., etc. I, I don't think that's a mainstream view, but the, I do account come across that. So both of those arguments feed into this particular point you made that perhaps we shouldn't do stuff with Japan because it might offend China and by the way where is Japan going anyway you know so but I, I actually don't think it's representative of the broader Australian the public view or our or our political elites for example I don't find that very frequently but you're absolutely right it does appear in our newspapers from time to time one Quickly. other thing that's worth emphasizing is that too often in the Australian media and in the public discourse, there tends to group together the South China Sea's maritime disputes and the, the dispute over the, the Senkaku or the Diaoyu Islands, right? Because they're all maritime disputes and we assume they're all of the same level of dangerousness. And in some ways, you know, the one area in the last year on maritime disputes where there's positive developments has been on the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, right? It's because both China and Japan have recognized there's an awful lot at stake. They've, they've kind of stepped back from it and worked really hard on that. And that just kind of goes to the point I was trying to make earlier. This is a relationship where Japan has got an awful lot invested in it. And so the narrative somehow that by working with Japan, which is now working very closely with China in this, you're somehow going against China is, is I, th I think, too sensitive by half, a little bit more Catholic than the Pope. Thanks very much, Gordon. I've got three people, now four or five more people. I'll take two or three questions to, to, uh, together. Thank you, one here. Anthony Bergen from uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. The ambassador, uh, uh, Japanese ambassador, referred this morning to the Australia-Japan strategic partnership in the Pacific. It's been completely overlooked in Australia. Um, I couldn't even find it on our uh, DFAT website, but it's a very important document for Australian-Japan relations in the Pacific. So I have three suggestions, opportunities in the spirit of this conference to, for the Admiral to think about as you uh, focused in your remarks on Oceania. One is that Australia and Japan could work together to support uh, the new Peacekeeping and Disaster Response Centre in Fiji. It's at Black Rock near Nandi. And Australia and Japan could very well work together to support regional efforts um, in that, through that centre. The second area is the one you yourself mentioned, and that's Micronesia. It's a very underdone area from Australia. I visited there last year. Very surprised we didn't even have a defence attaché, despite the fact, as you rightly say, the strategic stocks of Micronesia are rising with this massive US military build-up in Guam. So Australia and Japan could work together uh, much more in the north part of the Pacific. Um, and the third area is, some, a few people have mentioned the quadrilaterals. There is a quadrilateral agreement in the Pacific, and that's Australia, US, France and New Zealand. It relates to maritime domain awareness. 
And there's no reason why we couldn't make that quadrilateral a pentagon and include Japan. Thanks, okay, Anthony. Now the next question was up here. Hmm? No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Actually, this, okay. Both, both of you. Your next plates after that. Um, Andrew Carr from the Strategic and Defence Study Centre. I, I guess this is more of a, a comment, but I'd certainly be interested in the panel's um, kind of response. We've heard today, and especially in the Admiral's comments, but from a number of speakers, this picture of the regional order that is a pristine environment almost for the last 70 years of, of peace and prosperity, and then suddenly there's this new and unprecedented challenge today. I, and I can understand why we might try and frame it in that way, uh, particularly kind of pushing back against Chinese claims and aggression. But I wondered and worry just how accurate a picture that is, and if trying to tell ourselves this story, we're not misleading ourselves about what kind of a challenge we face. The challenges I see in the regional order aren't new. They are enduring. And in fact, this is mainly, um, in many ways, the challenge of them is that they have been so enduring for so many years. The Korean Peninsula, Taiwan, competing claims in the South China Sea. These are Cold War era problems that remain today. And while we, certainly China's challenge is significant and another step up, it's not the only country that's challenging this regional order. You know, to say that there is a, a universal acceptance of the regional order, I think, presents a, a completely different picture than what our history actually tells us. Uh, and that, you know, Vietnam and Philippines and Taiwan have their own views about how freedom of navigation and control of land and maritime assets should go. Indonesia, um, Thailand have I different ideas about governance, about democracy, about economics. And I think trying to tell ourselves this story of a clear US order that was established and, and run through to today kind of misleads us on, on our history, but also suggests a fragility to the order, that um, this is the first time it's been challenged and therefore it may not last beyond this moment, when actually this is an order that has endured despite these challenges and through these challenges in ways that analysts have often kind of predicted would fall short. So I guess my question to the, to the panel is, if we can't agree on understanding our history, how accurate are we going to be in, in kind of deciding and understanding the contemporary challenges and the right way to address these problems in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bates? <coughs> Thanks. Just a very quick comment in relation to the first that was raised earlier. Um, this notion that uh, simply through defense technological cooperation, uh, the Australian-Japan relationship will turn into some sort of virtual alliance. Uh, one point I haven't seen raised in all of this debate is quite the opposite outcome. Um, there are plenty of examples of defense technological relationships going very sour, in fact. Um, in spite of the good record that Japan has demonstrated domestically in terms of delivery, let's not forget this is the first time Japan's ever done this. Um, it's going to be a very difficult technological undertaking. Uh, there's no guarantee of its success. Uh, we know that even um, with, with countries that have had considerable export experience, such as Sweden, uh, we've had all sorts of issues and, and problems with the previous submarine uh, program. So, in other words, um, we need to remind ourselves that there is no guarantee whatsoever that defense technological cooperation leads to, to a virtual alliance of any kind. Just to underscore that. Thank you very much. Now, those are three questions that are all quite... Uh different. Now, can I just make my own comment on those, those comments of yours, Bates? I'd, I'd also make the comment that, um, contrary to what uh, certain people have said in recent days in the newspaper and whatnot, uh, Japan, Australia's experience with Japan in the commercial sphere and investment sphere is basically second to none in the sense that the Japanese honour contracts. They continue through with the delivery of the contracts. And I think... Uh, that's uh, very important indeed, even if there are possibly divergences later on in how we go about uh, our uh, respective interests in the uh, Indochina, in Indo-Asia Pacific region. Could I ask the uh, panel to very quickly comment, because we've only got five minutes left altogether. This might have to be the end of uh, the questions, depending upon how uh, brief your responses can be, please. Yep. I'll just respond to one very quickly. I mean, I wouldn't want to say for a second that the last 70 years is all in peace and light and everything's happy. Uh, but at the same time, to, to make the argument that somehow this has always been, you know, a, a system that was work not working and broken and this is just a continuation of the same, 
it, it misses what has been a fundamental shift in the last five years alone. Uh, and that is, you need to make the distinction between what's happened on, on land and what's happened in the sea and what's happened in the global commons. And if you look at the global commons, you know, the South China Sea territory disputes are not new. They've been there for 25, 30, 40 years. And the United States has regularly challenged the claims of its allies and other countries in the regions. Every time the Philippines say, you can't float through here, we'll charge the U.S. You know, you know, Navy through there just to prove that, that we can go through those straits, right? Uh, and and it, that, that kind of general order in terms of the global commons in the sea really has been maintained pretty pristine for the last 70 years. And it's only the capacity now of China to build new islands, to, to militarize, to declare defense zones, that is a fundamental shift. And so to say, yes, yes, it's always been a problem and it's, you know, it wasn't pristine before, it really, I think, you know, obfuscates what has been a fundamental shift, and I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, Admiral, would you care to make My answer uh, may not be uh, hit the point, but uh, the, I think the uh, uh, current uh, unstable uh, maritime security environment has been brought by, brought up by the uh, collapse of the power balance structure uh, since the end of the Cold War. And the, uh, uh, someone say to our power shifting, but uh, when it comes to the South China Sea, the only one state, uh, China uh, can uh, influence uh, her uh, control power uh, over the South China Sea. And uh, uh, so it's uh, good, it, whether it's uh, good or not, but uh, uh, some, uh, some nations uh, uh, may seem that the uh, China, uh, uh, conduct, China is conducting very coercive power uh, or uh, influence uh, assertive operations. So uh, the, uh, my idea is the uh, uh, setting up some uh, favorable power balance condition, power balance structure is very much important. And so the, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this background, the uh, capacity building for the uh, South China Sea nations uh, from the uh, Japan, Australia, or other nations are very important. Thank you. Alan. Yeah, just quickly on the first question, um, I'm pretty much in the same camp as Gordon in terms of my response, but you're arguing the con you're making the continuity argument. You're like, what's new, what's different, right? Um, so my answer to your question is there are a number of differences to this particular. First of all, there are multiple challenges to the, the old order, shall we say. It's not just China, it's also Russia, it's Iran in the Middle East, you know. So, so there are multiple challenges of a kind that we haven't previously seen because if you remember the old order was the contest between the old Soviet Union and the United States. So proxy wars broke out everywhere, but they were essentially contained within that framework. That doesn't, that's breaking down, that there is no comparable framework. The second thing is that the Soviet challenge to Pax Americana, and I'll call it that, okay, was primarily military and political, but not economic, because the Soviet Union imploded essentially because it lost the race economically. China hasn't made that mistake. It's an economic power and a growing one. So the, the challenge is more formidable and as Gordon said, in this part of the world, it's playing out in the maritime domain, not on land. And that's a critical difference. And that's what we're all talking about here. Uh, so there are, you're right, there is continuity and it's not a reflection on the resilience of, of, the, of Pax Americana so much as the, the, the complexity of the challenges. We haven't talked about Islamic State or any of the other things. So a lot of challenges to the order, the US has, has been, you can argue, about this relative decline from where it was 20 years ago. It does no longer dominate as it once did. So it means that we're going to have to look at new levers and new ways of adapting to these challenges, and that's a resilience question. And can I just say quickly on Bates's question about the risk of getting into, into a major technology agreement with Japan on the submarines, there is a downside, the risk side, and you're absolutely right, there is a risk, but I don't see that as being a critical risk, A, because the Japanese do deliver, right? And secondly, if you look at the nature of defence agreements in 2016 compared with, say, Sweden, you know, when we did the Collins class 30 years ago, they're qualitatively different in the sense that they're much more broad ranging, much more a partnership. They bring in industry. There's all sorts of differences 
that actually bring greater rewards to the partnership than was the case 30 years ago. So I think overall the risks are, are quite low uh, and that's why, that's why we're very happy, I think, to have Japan as a, as a bidder. All right, well, um, we've actually reached our limit, but I, there are a couple of questions, if um, I can uh, take them. Miles was one and another one here in front. Uh, my name's Miles Cooper. Uh, there's a natural focus on the bilateral dimension of this Australia-Japan partnership. <laughs> brief mentions of some other areas, Bay of Bengal, Micronesia, Southeast Asia got a few brief mentions, mainly economic. Now, Australia's worked very hard to develop defence links with Southeast Asia. I'm not sure how big a priority that has been for Japan, but I'm wondering about the panel's views on the value and the scope for collaboration between Australia and Japan uh, in the defence and security area with Southeast Asia. Thanks, Miles. And the other question here in front. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, John Blackson from the Strategic and Defence Study Centre here at ANU. Terrific panel. Uh, one question that springs to mind, and it's prompted by some of the discussion here this morning or this afternoon, is, you know, how much should we push back? The islands have been built, they're not going away, uh, and they're as legitimate, arguably, as anyone else's claims. Sure, they're bigger, they're more consequential, but what realistically can we do about it without really upsetting the apple cart and going where none of us want to go? Thank you. That's a good provocative question to end the uh, session with. Would uh, the panel like to take either or both of those two questions? The last one's too big for, for lunch, but, but um, <laughs> there is no question that there, another area of real potential upside for Australia-Japan cooperation is on security in Southeast Asia. Because to date, the same domestic considerations in Japan that limited Japan's security cooperation with Australia have limited their cooperation with Southeast Asia. And so now you've got an area where Australia has actually been on the front foot. They've been leading for a long time. They've got experience, they've got relationship, and it's a tremendous area of where Australia to say to Japan, come in, let's work together, whether it be Micronesia or Southeast Asia. So, great. Anybody else? Can I say something on the last provocative question yeah. from John Blacksland here? Um, what can we do about it as a fait accompli? I, I hear this all the time. So let me answer by asking you a question. So what are the consequences of not doing anything? What do you think will happen? I'll answer it for you, OK? This is what I think will happen. Um, so essentially China has occupied and milita is militarising those islands because there has been no pushback. So it's logical to assume that if no, there is no pushback, then they will continue to build up their military capabilities and then from those essentially unsinkable aircraft carriers in the South China Sea, uh, exercise effective control over the whole of South China Sea. But that's not the, the end of it, right? So if they've been successful there, if I was in China, I'd be thinking, why not do this somewhere else? Okay, where else can we do something similar? Uh, there are lots of opportunities. So. My, my point is, OK, we probably should have actually pushed back earlier and been firmer with China in explaining why we're opposed to it and what we're going to do about it. But we're now at this situation where we've, we're being asked the question again. So I think that China is responsive to pressures just as any country is. So they have their interests and they have their vulnerabilities and pressure points. So we need to start pointing out to China that this continues then there are going to be increasing costs for China in continuing to do so. The object of this is not to have a war with China, but to, to, to persuade the Chinese is not in their interest to continue along this policy line. That's the point. And so we need to marshal all our diplomatic and strategic resources to make that point. And there's all sorts of things that can be done, but my point is better to start now, better late than never, okay?